Hello, and thank you for joining me here today to talk about one of my favorite subjects, our native bees here in Maryland. My name is Sarah Yashua, and I've been a Baltimore County Master Gardener since 2014. And it was through this program that I learned how essential insects are as part of a healthy functional ecosystem. And I also discovered that many of our most beneficial bugs are in decline. With the Master Gardener Pollination Team, we reach out to the community and we explain the importance of the pollinators for our gardens, for our landscapes, and for our food supply as well. Without bees, most of our flowering plants would be in jeopardy. And this includes many of our most nutritious and delicious foods, such as our fruits, our nuts, our berries, and many of our vegetables. Our dinner plates would be so boring without bees. So it's really important that we all learn how to manage our properties in a way that helps support healthy bees so that they can keep doing that very important job, not just for us, but for our children and our grandchildren, and hopefully many generations yet to come. For those of you not familiar with Master Gardeners, it's a University of Maryland Extension program under the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources that takes that science-based knowledge from the university about sustainable gardening and landscape management practices. And it makes that information available to everybody in the community through various outreach programs. So if you're interested in learning more about us or about the other extension programs, or you have questions about your gardens or want advice on your landscapes, then please visit the University of Maryland Extension website. Today, we're going to talk about the native bees in our area. Who are they? Where are they? Why are they important? We'll touch briefly on the threats to their survival and then Finally, we're going to talk about those things that we can all do to help promote healthy bees. When most people think about bees, you know they think about those European honeybees. Honeybees are hardworking social insects that are essential for our large scale agriculture. But even though the honeybees have been here for hundreds of years at, as an agricultural species, they did not co-evolve with our local ecosystems and they're not native to North America. So we won't be talking about them much today except to compare them with our native bees. There are almost 450 species of native bees here in Maryland alone that have been essential for the reproduction of our flowering plants for over a hundred million years. And most of our native bees are gentle, solitary, mostly ground nesting bees that are drastically different from everything that you've heard about the honeybees. There's no single queen with tens of thousands of daughters helping her tender nest. There's no waggle dance giving to directions to a food source far away. And there's no barbed stinger. With our native bees, you are very unlikely to get stung. They are programmed for flight before fight. And with our native bees, almost every girl's a queen. Up to 90% of our flowering species depend on animals for transferring their pollen, and that's almost exclusively insects. They visit the flowers for food, the nectar provides sugars, carbohydrates for energy, and the sole purpose for the plant to produce nectar is to lure those pollinators in to visit their blossoms. Pollen is also very nutritious. It's packed with protein, it has essential amino acids, it's got fats, and it's got carbs. Turns out for our bees, it's a perfect baby food as well. You probably already know that pollination occurs when the grains of male pollen sticks to the pollinator as it forages for food and is transferred to the sticky female stigma on a flower in the same species. And if that pollen is transferred to the same flower or the same plant, it's called self-pollination. Although many of our plants are self-sterile and they will prevent that pollen from fertilizing the ovules. That movement of pollen to a flower on a different plant in the same species is called cross-pollination. And it's this mixing of genes through cross-pollination that res results in more vigorous plants that can adapt to changing conditions. And what we'll learn about today is how bees are especially good at providing that cross-pollination service. All the flowering plants compete to attract pollinators to visit their flowers. And the different traits 
such as their size, their shape, their color, their scent, and even their time of bloom are referred to as pollinator syndromes. And these flower traits have co-evolved with their pollinators for over 100 million years to attract a specific group of pollinators, which increases the likelihood that a pollinator is going to visit another flower in the same species. Those earliest flowering plants were very simple flowers that attracted beetles. Then, through coevolution with the flowers and their pollinator, which is mostly insects, has resulted in this incredible diversity of species in both our flowering plants and in our insects. Like changes in flowers triggered adaptations in, in, in the insects, and changes in insects triggered adaptations in the flowers. A good example of the selective adaptation would be the deep red tubular blooms that attract hummingbirds, but few insects can reach the nectar reward deep inside. Bees easily perceive colors in the blue and yellow end of the spectrum. So flowers that are bright white, yellow, blue, or purple are most attractive to them. Red colors, they can't really see them and they'll appear almost black to bees. However, they're still gonna be very attracted to the yellow disc flowers in the zinnia or the stark white anthers that you see in the poppy here, or they may be attracted to a floral or sweet scent. Nectar guides are visual cues that lead down to the nectar source. And they can be a contrasting color, such as you see in the iris in the video, or they can be ultraviolet, which is clearly visible to a bee's vision. The picture of the black-eyed Susan under a normal light and under a UV light reveals those dark ultraviolet nectar guides leading down to the nectaries. Now, once a flower is fertilized, it stops producing nectar, and it may change color in order to signal to the pollinator that there's no more food. This aster in late November, I don't know if you can really tell, but there's only one little cluster of flowers that has those um, vibrant yellow coloring, and it's still producing nectar, obviously, because the mast bees are all over it. Bees are the best pollinators for several reasons. First off, the bees tend to be hairy, which aids in the tra transferring of pollen between the flowers. They generate this positive charge when they're flying, which attracts the negatively charged pollen, and that pollen can stick all over them sometimes. Many of our bee species, especially bumblebees, are flower constant, and this means that they are more likely to visit the same sp species of flower on any single foraging trip, which of course greatly improves that likelihood of cross-pollination. Almost all of our female bees are, have an area of special branched hairs on their body that's called a scopa that is specifically for collecting and transporting pollen. And the scope is usually somewhere on their hind legs and they can be called pollen brushes when they're long hairs like on this green sweat bee. There's also a family of bees that has her scope of hairs on the underside of her abdomen. Here we have a leaf cutter bee and you can see her hairy belly. And here's another one that was caught on the way back to the nest, fully loaded up. Bumblebees and honeybees have pollen baskets on their hind legs, which are called curbiculi. And they are indentations that are surrounded by those bristly branched hairs and they moisten the pollen with nectar and saliva before they pack it into those pollen baskets and it really holds fast. Bees are by far the best pollinators, mainly because they collect pollen to take back to their nest to feed their young. All bee larvae eat pollen and with few exceptions, those adult female bees are built to gather it, pollinating the plants in the process. Most of our bees are generalist foragers that will collect pollen and nectar from almost any good source. But about a quarter of our native bee species are specialists 
And they're only going to forage for pollen to raise their young on specific plant species or maybe a small number of related plants. Examples of these species specific specialists would be this evening primrose sweat bee. It's the Lassia glassin enothera, which will only forage on evening primrose blossoms. And my personal favorite is this beautiful tiny spring beauty mining bee. This is an Andrina erigenia. And she's only going to collect pollen from the spring beauty wildflowers. And just look at all that beautiful pink pollen she has on her pollen brushes. Specialists are very beneficial to the plants, but there's added risks to their survival. Because if you lose the plant, then the bee is going to disappear as well. Bees will live and nest in anywhere where there's flowers offering pollen and nectar. And our native bees range in size from the tiny perdita at an eighth of an inch or less up to the size of a large carpenter bee, which is right around one inch. And how far they'll fly to, from their nest to forage for provisions mostly depends on the size of that bee. That large carpenter bee will travel for over a mile whereas that tiny perdita is only gonna travel a couple of hundred feet, like only perhaps across your backyard. Males don't sting, they don't have the equipment. And most of our solitary female bees, native bees will only sting as an absolute last resort. And no bees sting on flowers because they don't defend the flowers. And yes, the girls do all the work. All bees are complete insects. They go through four stages in life. They start out as an egg, which hatches into a larva. And then they'll go into a pupa stage where they go through that metamorphosis into their adult form. Now the adults from the previous generation don't usually come into contact with their offspring. The most immature bees, the only parental care they get are the provisions that are provided in the brood cells. Most of our native bees have a one year life cycle and the stage at which they're gonna survive the winter depends on the species, but almost all of them are going to remain in their natal nest through the winter. The female provisions each brood cell with a mixture of pollen and nectar that's called bee bread onto which she's gonna lay a single egg before sealing the cell and then moving on to the next one. Bumblebees, a little unique in that they lay, may, may lay multiple eggs in their honeypot brood cells. One to five days after the egg is laid, this soft rub-like larva emerges. All the bees' growth is going to occur in this stage. And as they expand from eating their bee bread, they're gonna grow in size like 150 times. And they're gonna to grow too big for their skin. So they're gonna molt out of that exoskeleton four or five times. After the final molt, most of our native bee larvae are gonna spin a silk cocoon around themselves and prepare to go through that metamorphosis into an adult. And this is called their pupil stage. But those bees that don't spin a cocoon depend on the cell lining that's provided by the mother to protect it. Most of our bees spend about 85% or more of their entire life inside that dark natal nest developing into their adult, which will then emerge from the nest fully formed and full grown. You are never going to see immature bees outside of their nest. Now, the bees in the zinnia may look like a mama and baby, but they're actually two full grown adult bumblebees. They may be um, bees in different species that have different sizes but similar markings, but it's most likely a queen bumblebee next to a full-grown daughter or male. Now, the majority of our native bees are active as adults for only three to eight weeks. Our native bees are going to nest in all sorts of social arrangements, but almost all of them are solitary, having only one generation each year, and that single female does all the work to build and provision her nest. There are some solitary bee species that will nest in dense congregations where there's many bees nesting in an area that's very favorable, but they're each tending their own brood cell. 
There are some communal nesters that will share a common entrance, but they're provisioning their own brood cells. And we do have a few sweat bee species that are semi-social with the daughters from a first generation helping to care for two or maybe one more, three generations in a year. Then we have bumblebees, which form annual social colonies with a queen bee that'll have several generations of daughters helping her tender nest in a year. About 15% of our bees are kleptoparasites. Well, what's that? They're cuckoo bees. Just like the cuckoo bird, they steal into the nest of a host species and lay their eggs in those brood cells. 70% of our native bees nest in the ground. They are all around us and we rarely notice them because they simply don't bother us. Most of our ground nesting bees are gonna prefer loose, well-drained soil that's bare or sparse, but there are digger bees that are gonna actually prefer hard packed clay. Some of our species are gonna prefer earthen banks and others in flat areas, but it's typically in a sunny spot and it's not usually in your richer soils. Most of the other 30% of our native bees nest in tunnels, small tunnels such as maybe hollow plant stems or abandoned beetle holes in wood. Unlike most of our tunnel nesters that use existing tunnels, the female carpenter bees are going to bore holes into rough unfinished wood to lay her eggs. To make that tunnel nest, a female bee is going to divide the tunnel into a row of brood cells. And depending on the species, those partitioning walls might be constructed of mud or plant resin or leaf pieces or flower petals. Some will be used secretions such as wax or cellophane like materials. Now, these par partitions help protect the developing bee and its food from drying out and from excess moisture, fungi, and diseases. Now the mother bee can control the sex of the egg when she lays it. If she fertilizes the egg and it has the chromosomes from both parents, it's gonna hatch into a female. If she doesn't fertilize it, just has her chromosomes, it's gonna hatch into a male. So she's going to start her tunnel nest with females and finish up with males. Males don't take as long to develop, and when they come out in spring, they're going to hang around pretty close by because as soon as the females come out, that mating is going to happen right away. During the four to six weeks that the female mason bees that you see in the video are active, they can produce one or two eggs each day and generally around 30 eggs in her lifetime. <laughs> Unlike the European honeybee that can lay 1,500 eggs in a day during her peak season and up to 200,000 eggs in a year. The social bees are opportunistic. They nest in found cavities. The bumblebees are going to build their honey pot brood cells in a dry cavity under the ground, such as maybe an abandoned mouse den or a tussock of grass or under a hollow log. And the queen produces those wax honey pots from glands in her abdomen, and she uses them for storing pollen and nectar as well as for brood cells for her eggs. There are feral honeybees that will use hollows in trees or other structures but most of our honeybees are domesticated living in man-made structures. Both bumblebees and honeybees are social bees. They will defend their colony, so it's best to avoid their nests. Families are, when we talk about them, they're usually grouped together because they generally have several traits in common. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> And we'll see bees in the five families that are listed here. And even though bees in a family will great, vary greatly in their size and their appearance, one of the common traits that's really important is the form and length of their tongue. The tongue is very important to a bee because it determines what kind of flowers they have access to forage on. Believe it or not, this little green sweat bee has a short tongue, whereas the bumblebees can have very long tongues that they fold under them when they're not in use. Here are examples of those five different families of native bees that are found in Maryland. The sweat bees are in the Helectidae family. 
the mining bees are in the Andrinidae family. The polyester bees are in the Calitidae family, and the bees in the Megachylidae family are generally known as leafcutter bees. Now, the Apidae family doesn't have a common name, but that may be because so many of the genera within that family do have common names, such as the carpenter bee you see here. There's also bumblebees, honeybees, digger bees, and squash bees are all in that same family. And we're going to explore each of these families just just a little closer because they are all so very important and very interesting. Bumblebees are in that apidae family and they come in different sizes and markings, but there's 14 species here in Maryland that all have a very rotund shape and they make this buzzing sound when they fly. These are generalist foragers that will fly from early spring until late fall, even in cool drizzly weather when your honeybees are all snuggled up in their hive. The bumblebees nest in those cavities under the ground, forming the annual social colony, with only the late season females living through the winter in order to become next year's queens. And the queen's daughters help to raise the broods, and they can have several generations in a nest by the end of the year. These bees are very important for agriculture because they will buzz pollinate crops that have closed anthers, such as our tomatoes and our blueberries. They disengage their wings from their flight muscles and vibrate, making this middle C, and it just drops that pollen right out of those flowers. The bumblebees are raised commercially and distributed to greenhouses for pollinating those crops, such as our tomatoes and our cucumbers and our strawberries. All carpenter bees excavate tunnels and then they use that chewed pith or wood to divide their brood cells. And the large eastern carpenter bee is our largest native bee, also well known for chewing those nest cavities in wood. She looks similar to a bumblebee, but they're larger and they have a shiny, almost hairless abdomen. And they're important for pollinating many crops, such as the passion fruit you see in the video, as well as blackberries and peppers. Here we have one caught in the act of being a nectar thief, chewing a hole in the side of the flower to get to the nectar inside rather than running on, running by any pollen. And a lot of times this will be the males that do this. There are small carpenter bees in the Serotina genus, and these are about the size of a grain of rice. And she lacks the jaw strength to actually chew solid wood. So she'll nest instead in the um, pithy centers of perennial stems. In fact, that stem has to be broken open in order for her to get access inside. But she is so cool because when she's done filling her nest and she's gonna only use like one cane from maybe a berry bush or something, she's gonna place herself as a guard at the entrance and she remains there throughout the winter, even though she dies, but she's blocking that nest. Sweat bees are small to medium sized bees. They got their name because many of the species are attracted to the salts and human sweat. And most of our sweat bees are generalist foragers that nest in the ground. And some of those species are semi-social. They may have two or more generations in a year. And those nests can be really complicated mazes by the time the season's over. Those sweat bees all have short tongues. So they're going to forage on open flowers that have easy access to the pollen and nectar. In the Southwest, farmers have been very successful at attracting alkali sweat bees for pollinating their large alfalfa seed fields. And they do this by creating a salt flat that surrounds that field. And it attracts very dense aggregations of these sweat bees. And although the sweat bees are worldwide, the green metallic sweat bees are only found in the Americas, and they are one of our most noticed bees in the garden. Mining bees are tiny to medium-sized solitary ground nesters that are found in all types of habitats, and some will even nest in lots. But don't worry, because their stinger is so weak, it won't penetrate human skin. Typically, they're going to prefer sandy, loose soil in areas that are near or under shrubs, and a few species will nest in these dense aggregations when the conditions are just right. They usually burrow straight down and then they construct their brood cells radiating out from that central shaft. 
and she'll use an oily secretion to line the walls of her nest and her brood cells, which helps to stabilize the soil. You can usually tell the mining bees because she wears her scope of hairs high up on her hind legs and even onto her thorax. The very large percentage of our mining bees are specialist foragers. Like the bumblebees, mining bees are also able to buzz pollinate crops. Honeybees can't do this. So they're important for pollinating berries, tomatoes, and asparagus and clover. The Kalitidae family of bees is the most diverse family that we have, but none of the bees in this family have been developed for commercial pollination. They are small to medium-sized, solitary, ground-nesting bees, typically have a heart-shaped face, <laughs> and they have this extremely short tongue that's split into two lobes at the end. They're commonly called polyester bees or cellophane bees or plaster bees, and they're named for a waterproof material that the female secretes to line her burrow. She uses that lobe tongue just like a paintbrush, and she wipes it their waterproofing material on her nest walls and in the cells. Because they have that very short tongue, they tend to forage on plants in the carrot and aster families. Now, many species of our Calites bees like to build horizontal nests in vertical surfaces. So they'll nest in the fallen root balls, I mean, the root balls from fallen trees. And they'll also nest in riverbanks because their nests can withstand some periodic flooding. <laughs> Many of our um, polyester bees are going to put this membrane over their entrance, kind of like a little doggy door. <laughs> the Haleas genus are called mast bees in this family, and they are a little different. They nest in stems, hollow stems, rather than in the ground. But she also has no pollen collecting hairs, and she's going to still collect pollen and nectar and take it back to her nest stored in a crop or what's called a honey stomach. And last but certain not least, we have the megachylidae family of bees, which are unique in two ways. The females all have the scope of hairs on the underside of her abdomen, and they collect pollen dry. And unlike other bees that build their brood cells using secretions, all the bees in this family construct their nests using foreign materials. And the common name for their genus, it'll give you a good clue as to what their materials are that they're going to use. The mason bees are going to use mud. The resin bees are going to use resins. The carter bees are going to use wool-like plant fibers. And of course, the leaf cutter bees are going to use pieces of leaf. In fact, this species of leaf cutter bee, I always find her with her abdomen tilted up to keep that po dry pollen from rubbing off. The European alfalfa bee was introduced to pollinate those large, it's raised commercially and distributed for um, those large alfalfa seed fields. The um, leaf cutters use their mandibles to cut specific size leaves to surround their brood cells. All the other bees use partitions or, you know, walls, this leaf cutters, all of them will surround their brood cells. And she's going to use the specific size pieces, what, like oval pieces for the sides and circular pieces for the ends. And she does seem to prefer our red buds and our roses for building materials. Mason bees are a superstar pollinator in that hairy be belly bees. They are gentle, solitary, very non-aggressive tunnel nesting bees. They use the mud to construct their tunnel nests. And they are in a class by themselves when it comes to pollinating any early blooming fruit tree or berry bush. And what's surprising is that their efficiency at pollination is due to their lack of efficiency at getting that pollen back to her nest. She's going to zigzag back and forth between the trees and she belly flops all over the flowers, rubbing that dry pollen on her, on her um, scope of hairs. And she is going to leave substantially more pollen behind than other bees do. The blue orchard bees, or Bob, are raised commercially and distributed across the country for orchard pollination. And for each foraging trip, she's going to visit about 75 flowers, and it's going to take about 25 trips for one pollen load. So she visits almost 2,000 flowers for each baby bee. 
Unfortunately, many of our mason bees are being displaced by the Japanese horn-faced bees that were introduced in the 1960s to pollinate the apple orchards in Washington state. Up to 25% of our mason bee species are at risk or have already disappeared. As you already know, those European honeybees are another superstar pollinator. They're domesticated honeybees that were introduced as an agricultural species back in colonial times. And they were brought for their wax to make candles, since there was no electricity, and for their honey as a food sweetener. They weren't brought here for pollination because there was many native bees that were taking care of that pollination for the crops they were growing at the time. But it's this domestication that makes these honeybees so incredibly important for agriculture today. You can take an entire honeybee colony of tens of thousands of bees, you can put them in a box, you can put them on a truck, and you can cart them clear across the country for a major crop at bloom time, such as the over million acres that have almond trees that all come into bloom at the same time. Once they're done pollinating them blooms, it's back in the box, back on the truck and off to another crop at its, mate, at its bloom time. <clears throat> In fact, our large scale agriculture would simply not be possible without the pollination services of our commercial beekeepers. So which of these superstars is the best pollinator? There is an answer to this and the answer is it depends. <laughs> These bees could not be any more different. They're kind of like Felix and Oscar <laughs> in the odd couple. The mason bees are those gentle, solitary bees where each female does all the work to construct and provision her nest, whereas the honey bees have that hollow that has that, have that colony that has tens of thousands of bees that are all aggressively tending and defending their hive. The mason bees are only active in spring, whereas the honeybees are active all year round. The female mason bees has to find all her possible forage resources, and she's only going to fly for about 300 feet from her nest to find forage. Honeybees, they will direct other foragers in the nest to a good food source, perhaps miles away using her waggle dance. The mason bee has this really erratic way of jumping from tree to tree and crashing into the flowers. And the foraging honeybee is highly meticulous. She's going to gather pollen and nectar from flowers along a branch until she's finished with all of those and she moves to a different branch. The mason bees have those scopa hairs on her abdomen that readily pick up and drop off pollen as she's rubbing her belly all over those blossoms. But the honeybees mix nectar with that pollen that they've collected, and they're going to pack it into those pollen baskets instead of letting the pollen transfer to the next flower that she visits. An acre of flowering fruit trees generally requ requires 30 to 40,000 honeybees. It's usually two hives in order to pollinate all those blossoms. 250 mason bees can do the same job. The mason bees have a 95% pollination rate, whereas the honeybees have a 5% pollination rate. So for early spring orchard pollination, the mason bees hands down provide the far superior cross-pollination service. But the ability to transport honeybee colonies to crops throughout the entire growing season over great distances makes them the most overall effective pollinator for our large scale agriculture. And for the most complete pollination, both of these bees working together give you the most successful pollination rates. It's difficult to tell bees from wasps since they're so closely related. Like shortly after the flowering plants evolved, bees diverged from wasps through evolution. They're kind of like the wasps that went vegetarian. They were, <clears throat> you can, I'm sorry. You can usually tell the bees from the wasps by using their shape. The wasps tend to be very narrow waists with a, with a slender profile, whereas the bees are going to be much more robust. 
the bees are going to tend to be hairy and the wasps will not. But the real tell for me are the wasps have these long, spindly, hairless legs. Now, unlike social wasps, such as our paper wasps, our yellow jackets, and our hornets, all the wasps that you see here are solitary wasps, very beneficial at pest control, very unlikely to sting people. So you really want to see these wasps in your gardens. Now for the bad news, native bee populations like animals worldwide are disappearing at an alarming rate. And there's several known causes for the decline in bees. The greatest risk of all is habitat loss and fragmentation. As we alter our landscapes ac across America with our commercial properties, our suburban lawns and our agriculture, there's ever diminishing resources for our pollinating insects. This is where every one of us can really make a difference. Pesticides can kill bees either directly or it can kill them over time from prolonged exposure. It can affect their reproduction or it can kill all the flowering plants that they need to survive. In the case of our bees, those toxins are frequently transferred to the developing bees in the nest on that collected pollen. The mass raising of bees for commercial distribution, such as our honeybees, our bumblebees, our mason bees, and leafcutter bees, has resulted in the introduction of countless alien viruses and other diseases and mites and other parasites that our native populations haven't developed any resistance to. The introduced non-native species frequently outcompete our native species for those diminishing resource. It's considered a rule of thumb that a single honeybee colony requires an entire acre of flowering resources, such as trees, shrubs, and other herbaceous flowering plants in order to thrive. And as social bees, they're more aggressive and they will outcompete our native bees for those resources. And as if all that isn't enough, climate change can break that synchronous relationship between a specialist bee whose time is based on warmth and their host plant that is responding to timing based on sunlight. So in our world, it's a really challenging place for the bees. The good news is it is so easy to help protect our bees. And the best way to help is to establish safe habitat for them that provides the food, the water, the shelter, and their space, and have undisturbed patches of this habitat close to bet together. And as always, please avoid using pesticides. Let's talk about this habitat just a little closer. The main characteristic you want to consider for a habitat location is that the site be in full sun for at least part of the day and that it be mostly open. The ideal here is to have nesting opportunities and forage resources in the same area. For pollen and nectar food sources, you want to plant a variety of trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals, and herbs. And for those perennials and annuals, plant them in clumps of three to seven plants, forming a really nice mound. You want to choose diverse plant groups with different sizes, shapes, and colors. Do plan for your gardens to provide food throughout the entire growing season from early spring through late fall. And if those good forage plants just happen to be weeds, consider leaving them as a resource before mowing them. Native plants provide the best food for our native pollinators due to coevolution. And many of our native plants have a strong preference for the pollen of our native plants. So the native plants offer us an a lot of advantages as well. <laughs> In general, they're less likely to require pesticides. They don't need fertilizer. They're less likely, they need less water. They're not going to become invasive. Oh yes, we've got some thugs out there that can be pretty darn aggressive, but technically they're not invasive. But our native plants are so incredibly important because they promote that native biodiversity that's essential for an ecosystem to function. No matter what your soil and light conditions, there's a native plant that's going to thrive there. You do want to try and find the straight species because they tend to have more resources for the pollinators rather than those fancy cultivars. An exception to this would be the cultivars that were bred for disease resistance. Yeah. 
You want to provide a safe place for your bees by keeping some untidy corners and piles of woody debris. If possible, leave your snags standing if they're not risk to person or property. And the leaf cover is really great shelter and nesting area. Shelter is especially important during those times when the insects aren't active. So protect their overwintering sites by leaving your fall cleanup until much later in spring. For those of you that want a tidy look in winter, after the birds are done eating the seeds, you can cut your flower stalks on your perennial stems back to 12 inches. And then those stalks will be used next year for nesting materials for our bees. And that new growth in spring is going to quickly hide all that stock stubble and the leaf cover for, from people, but it won't hide it from our bees. The most important nesting areas to provide for bees are undisturbed areas of sparse or bare ground. Even small areas are beneficial, especially if they're close to clumps of flowers, but they do have to remain undisturbed until the young adults emerge the following year. And there are so many options for creating interesting tunnel nesting sites, such as drilling dead trees or wooden blocks. There, you do bundles of commercial cardboard bee tubes or bundles of reeds or hollow perennial stems. Consider replacing areas of turf grass with beneficial habitat. Turf grass provides no food value or shelter for any of your pollinators. The only thing you're feeding here are Japanese beetle grubs. If having a lawn is important, then consider raising your mower blade higher to about four inches and let the clover and the violets bloom before cutting them. Better yet, replace an area of turf grass with a native tree and surround it with a shade tolerant native ground cover, such as the foam flowers you see here. Plant them out to the drip line and as that tree matures, let that ground cover expand so that it's always out of the drip line and you leave this entire area undisturbed. And this is a perfect way to improve your property with healthy, beautiful space that supports wildlife. Flowers that bloom in very early spring are a critical resource for our early emerging bees, such as the new bumblebee queens, the mining bees, the mason bees, and the ephemeral Natives such as our Virginia bluebells or the spring beauties or the columbine are a really great resource that does well in shade. But the best resources for early spring are our early flowering trees, such as our native red maple, the um, willows, the black cherry, the um, wild crab apple, and the eastern redbud are all really good choices. Although our bulbs are not typically native, they do provide an early season resource. So you can go ahead and plant the bulbs, but especially the grape hyacinth and for earlier in spring and the alliums for a little bit later. When you're planting your vegetable garden in spring, be sure and include clumps of flowering perennials or annuals that's gonna lure those bees in and that will really improve your yield. There is such an abundance of lovely native summer blooming perennial plants with plenty of resources for our bees, such as our Asclepias, the Gallardia, the Monarda, the Liatris, the Lobelia, the Etruchium, the Agastache, the Coriatis. There's The list just goes on and on and on. And there's a lot of good sources of recommendations for plants in our area, such as the Xerxes Society or the Pollinator Partnership. But my personal favorite is this National Wildlife Federation plant finder that will make recommendations for native plants in your area based on your zip code and how beneficial they are for wildlife. Echinacea is not native to the Mid-Atlantic, but it is an easy to grow composite that is very attractive to bees. So we say yes to cone flowers. For summer blooming trees, you can choose an American basswood or a pagoda dogwood. Fall blooming plants are an important energy source for our late season pollinators, especially those late season female bumblebees that have to bulk up so they can survive the winter and become next year's queens. So plant asters, solidago, the horsemint, the vernonia, and um, the native 
helianthus are perennial sunflowers, such as the thin leaf that you see here, or the oxi, are especially good pollen and nectar sources. Plus, they're host plants for many of our native mining bee species. Annuals also provide a wonderful source of nectar and pollen all season long, usually well into late fall. And some of our favorite annuals for bees are the zinnias, the cosmos, the salvias, the sunflowers. Herbs and mints are great for our smaller bees, but you have to let them bloom. And you might want to put your mints in containers because they can be real spreaders. As for maintenance, you still remove excessive weeds because they will take the nutrients, the water, and the sun from your pollinator plants. But if you include a combination of those warm season bunch grasses in around your herbaceous flowering plants, you can create this really tight living mass that will resist weeds. Mulch with compost or shredded leaves to actually improve your soil. And you do want to avoid tilling. Not only does it break down the soil structure and dry out your soil, mm -hmm. but it disrupts those microbes that are essential for healthy plant growth. And tillage will destroy the nests of any shallow ground nesting bees. Specialists like squash bees like to build their nests very close to their host plant. And that doesn't go well. And please, please, please leave your leaves in the gardens. There are all sorts of beneficial insects that are trying to survive the winter there. One good way to help bees is to talk about them with your family, friends, and neighbors. Making people aware of the importance of bees and the risks of their survival is the first step in changing our environment to promote healthy bee populations. There's other ways to help, such as installing and maintaining a pollinator garden in a public space, such as a church, a school, or a library, or you, Perhaps you could coordinate a corridor of pollinator habitat with your neighbors. And be sure and spread the word to use the University of Maryland Extension website to learn about integrated pest management. This is a technique for controlling pests without toxic chemicals whenever possible. And for more information, there are many excellent resources on our native bees and other pollinators, along with essential gardening techniques to help support them. All these materials were used in the content of this program, but a couple of particularly enjoyable reads were Our Native Bees by Paige Embry and The Mason and Bee Revolution by Dave Hunter and Jill Leitner. So I hope you enjoyed this brief introduction to our native bees in Maryland, and I hope you're inspired to help save them. And it's people like us that are gonna change our landscapes to help support native bees by doing what we like to do, plant native flowering plants that are gonna bloom during the entire growing season and leave areas undisturbed for shelter. And be sure and spread that word that we need bees. So thank you again for joining me here today.